All right, uh, let's get started. Let me get the. That's true. Yeah, we we haven't we haven't met in a while. So, welcome back. Um, wel welcome back from all the uh, the weather and and the holiday and whatnot. So we got to get back on track with with concrete design. Um, so a couple things. Uh, first off, let's talk about homework and homeworks to come. Um, question got brought up right before class. Uh, number one. Uh, is the homework one? Is homework one going to be delayed? And the answer is no, because there, it's not as if we have new material to cover. Like we covered everything that needs to be done in order to successfully negotiate homework one. So that homework, like there's no reason that it can't be turned in on Monday. But homeworks to come, like homeworks two, homeworks three, homeworks four, etc. I mean, if you all recall, I have a, a pretty sort of. A, a, no pun intended, pretty concrete schedule on, no, that was a good one, come on. That was a good one, come on. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, but we have a, a pretty rigid schedule in terms of what we're covering and, and uh, on day to day. So what's probably going to happen is while homework one isn't going to get delayed, the rest of them are. So like homework two might get shifted back, homework three, et cetera. I'm going to do my best to try and catch us back up. My goal is on um, uh, March. Here's my goal, and I may, this may seem like looking far ahead. This is the day before spring break. This is a makeup day, but I put in the schedule for weather. Okay, but that's the day before spring break. I want to see if we can catch up so we still don't have to meet that day. So that's a long way down the line. But I think over 20 lectures, we should be able to catch up. So I'm going to try and keep booking a little bit. I might upload some things on Blackboard to make the lectures go a little faster. But my goal is, is to, to, to try and catch up. So we'll see how that works. Um, so homework one is still going to be due on Monday. There's no reason that, that it can't be completed. I thought I would throw a little bit of a, I don't want to say hint, but maybe make your lives a little easier. On uh, problem one, determining the factored load on the column, there's, there's two ways of doing that. You can, um, you can use just the pressure load times the tributary area to get the load on the column, or you can do the hip bone connected to the leg bone thing. You know, take the reactions from the beams to the girders, et cetera, like we did in class. My piece of advice to you is do it the first way. Just take pressure times area uh, and accordingly. So your live load uh, element factor, your KLL, would not be two, it would be four. So that, that's sort of my advice. It'll, it'll be quicker. So that, that, that's, that, that's uh, all I'll, I'll really throw. That's really all I need to. The rest of the homework should be pretty simple. Um, I mean, problem three should take you about five minutes. It's pretty short. Um, <coughs> so that, that's pretty straightforward. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. What? what? I did, I did build my schedule to handle snow loads. I did. I, I didn't. I think I've got an appropriate PSF built in the background, but maybe I should have thrown a higher factor of safety on that thing. Puns never end. The puns never end. Good to be back. <laughs> um, any other big questions? OK. So today, um, oh, one other thing. So uh, technical conference. Um, the technical conference is coming up this Thursday, or this coming Thursday on the 25th. Um, I thought I would throw this out at you. Um, I am sure the day of we are going to need volunteers, okay? Just I'm telling you, it all, it's always the case, okay? This is a chance for you to interact with people that might hire you, okay? So getting them to see your face, getting to shake their hand, getting them to know your name, this is a very strong opportunity uh, for you to potentially get an employment uh, 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 gig over the summer, uh, maybe turning into a, a, a permanent employment gig when you uh, uh, get out of Marshall. That is, if you can get past some of these you know, crazy concrete design professors uh, and, and what have you. So um, if you are interested in volunteering, if you're interested in being part of this, please contact Megan Bates. She's the uh, 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 captain or the, the, the president of the SAME ASC student chapter and contact her as soon as possible so that we can get um, we can get uh, uh, a volunteer list developed. Sound good? Okay. Today, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, uh, we're, we're actually today, this is the first day where we're actually going to talk about concrete. 
Um, the past week, what we were really talking about is just like overarching topics related to structural engineering. Like it really wasn't um, uh, uh, focused on concrete or steel or anything. I mean, the stuff that we were talking about with like dead loads and live loads, it really applies to every structure. This is reinforced concrete design, so it's time to talk about concrete. Now, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, or at least some of it, is going to be familiar, especially for you uh, folks that took me last semester for civil engineering materials. Civil engineering materials used to be a prerequisite for this class um, because there was an understanding that you needed you know, an understanding of, of mixed design and whatnot to, to do reinforced concrete design. In all honesty, you really don't. Um, all you need is a fundamental understanding of some basic properties, which you can cover quite quickly. So some of the stuff that you see here will be um, familiar from concrete design. But what we do in here and what we did in materials are completely, completely different. So hold on. Might help if I turn that on. Okay. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some properties related to concrete and some properties related to steel that are going to be very important to us. Now, just so everybody is aware, and this is primarily for the folks that didn't have me last semester for materials, um, you should know that there is a difference between cement and concrete, right? What's the difference between cement and concrete, for those of you uh, that had me last semester? Cement is a binder. Cement is an ingredient that goes into concrete. Concrete is a, a mixture of aggregates, um, cement and water to create a, a material that we use in, in civil engineering called concrete. So just so you're aware, there is a difference. Um, all, you know, we're going to talk about some, some fundamental properties of concrete, like its compressive strength, its modules of elasticity, and we'll talk about those specifics here in a second. But if there is any one property, any one property that I want you to have burned in the back of your head throughout uh, uh, this semester and throughout your civil engineering education, it is this. Concrete is a material that behaves very well when it is subjected to compression. But when it is subjected to tension, not so much. Concrete is a material that has a very high compressive strength when it's being pushed on, but when it's being pulled on, it has a very low tensile strength. Usually, on average, somewhere between like 8 and 12 percent, something like that. You know, if you have a compressive strength uh, of like 4,000 PSI, its tensile strength might be something like 450 psi, it's much less, okay? So um, uh, that's, that's a property that I really want you to understand. I mean, the, the main concept behind reinforced concrete design is concrete is a material that is ver very weak in tension, so what do we do to help uh, a, a concrete element's resistance to tension? We put rebar in it. That, that's reinforced concrete design in a nutshell, so I just want you to, uh, to be aware of that. Now. In order to determine fundamental uh, properties of concrete or, or of any material, um, the simplest way to do that is to do some experimental testing, to do some physical uh, assessment of a material's properties. And it usually, uh, more often than not, involves some destructive test. For those of you who are in concrete design, we did quite a bit of this last semester. Um, the cylinders that we used in concrete design were a little smaller. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, <coughs> but the, the most fundamental test that you can uh, uh, perform on a concrete element in order to determine its properties is a compressive strength test. You basically have a concrete cylinder uh, of a very specific set of dimensions according to ASTM testing standards, and we basically take that cylinder and under a controlled testing rate, take it and compress it, just push on it until it crushes. And then we record its response, and its response will tell us some fundamental properties of that uh, mix. One of the things that you will find with concrete design is concrete, uh, because of its very nature, concrete's properties are very heavily dependent upon what is called the mix design, the proportion of how much cement and how much water and how much aggregate you throw into a, uh, uh, into a given batch of concrete. For those of you who did not have civil engineering materials as, uh, last semester, that was a big part of that class is how do you proportion aggregates and cement and water in order to achieve uh, a, a target performance for a given mix. And testing of concrete is a way of evaluating that. So that's sort of the uh, sort of the point. Now, what you will find is that concrete, is uh, its properties are, are highly variable. So, so for instance, what happens, this is for the materials folks in here, what happens to a concrete batch's compressive strength when the water-cement ratio goes up? 
it goes down, right? More water you throw into a, a, a concrete mix, the more water you throw into it, the weaker it is, okay? So the, the point I'm making is that you can tailor a, a, a specific batch of concrete in order to achieve certain performance. So depending upon the uh, uh, relationship of how much aggregate and cement and water, et cetera, you can get different responses. One of the most fundamental responses that we are interested in as civil engineers when it comes to concrete is a concrete batch's compressive strength. And what I mean by that, you take that cylinder, take it, and you're compressing it until it fails. Compressive strength is essentially the maximum amount of compressive stress that a given batch of concrete can experience. Depending upon your, your batch of concrete, that could be something like 2,000 PSI, 3,000 PSI, 4,000 PSI, uh, et cetera. Very common values in uh, building design uh, and, and bridge design and what have you are something like 3,000 and 4,000 uh, PSI. Uh, in fact, you know, you go to, uh, I mean, depending upon your construction, there are even limits that, you know, you can't be below certain uh, uh, PSI uh, values and what have you. So <laughs> that's one of the values that given a, a particular design problem or given a particular uh, challenge that we'll face in here, that's one of the values that we'll either assume right off the bat or specify right off the bat. You know, design this beam with a concrete that has a compressive strength of what have you. And if you're, if those of you that didn't have materials, it's like, well, how do you design a batch of concrete that has a certain compressive strength? Take CE 321. We'll talk all about it in there. Okay? Or well, I say we. I don't know if I'm teaching that class. We'll we'll, we'll see what happens. What's that? Huh. Materials. You were in there. What? You defended me. <laughs> you defended me from violence. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, a couple, a couple of notes about the nature of concrete. And this is going to break out either your civil engineering materials knowledge or your mechanics of deformable bodies knowledge. Okay. Concrete is a material that behaves very non-linearly. Okay. And what I mean by that is concrete's behavior is a little different than something like, let's say, a rubber band. Okay. If I have a rubber band, and I take that rubber band and I pull on it and I let it go, it snaps back into its original position, right? If you plot that, you will find that under those stress ranges, more often than not, that, that uh, rubber band is going to behave very linearly. The relationship between how much stress you put on that rubber band and how much it deforms is a pretty linear relationship. Concrete, uh, that's not the case. Concrete is a very nonlinear material. And that can create challenges when you're trying to determine things like stresses, like deflections. You know, if you have a concrete beam, is it deflecting two and a half inches or two inches, et cetera? That can create challenges. But we do need um, a, a modulus of, of elasticity for, for calculation purposes. Um, now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if you all remember, I mean, the, the modulus of elasticity, the modulus of elasticity is essentially the slope of your stress strain curve, right? You have that linear range of the stress strain curve. You have stress over strain, that straight line portion. That is your, uh, your Young's modulus. But for concrete, that, that's kind of uh, difficult. What we typically do in, in the concrete world is if we have, let's say, a, a curve that looks something like this, and let's say I want to determine the modulus of elasticity for, let's say, this 6 KSI concrete, what I'm really talking about is the slope of a line that looks something about like this. I could have done a little better. Maybe something like that. So, so really, really what I'm looking for is that slope. And that slope is E or your Young's modulus. Y'all remembering this from deformables or materials or even structural analysis? We used E in structural analysis all the time to determine uh, deflections and what have you. Well, we need a, a similar model in order to determine that for concrete materials. Concrete is a very complex material. It's very nonlinear. Uh, it, it, it's highly variable uh, and et cetera. So what that's going to do is break out uh, the use of an empirical relationship. We've already dealt with empirical relationships before when we looked at live load reduction. Okay. So what I'm getting at is um, if you have a compressive strength, like if you have a concrete, let's say I have a batch of concrete and I know its compressive strength is 4,000 PSI. 
how do I determine a Young's modulus that I can use? Well, here, here's a, a, a model that you can use. So, um, there, are, there are two different models that you can use depending upon the type of concrete that you're dealing with. Now, the equations will generally give you the same answer if you're dealing with normal weight concrete. Like if you take 33 times the unit weight of normal weight concrete raised to the 1.5, it comes out to about 57,000. So these are pretty much the same equation. It's just the second equation is a little easier to use and is obviously going to be much more common since normal weight concrete is what you're going to normally see. So that's why we call it normal weight concrete. Bless you. Now, <laughs> this slide um, has a, a little you know, quirk to it, and, and this is something that you're, you're going to have to get used to in the world of concrete design. You know, if you, let's, let's look at units. Okay, bless you. What are the units of FC prime? What are the units of a compressive strain? It's a stress, so it's going to be something like PSI or KSI or something like that. But that's the same units for a Young's modulus, for a modulus of elasticity. It's also going to be PSI. So, if I, like for instance, if I look at this lower equation, how do I take the square root of a PSI and get a PSI? Like, like that doesn't make sense from a unit standpoint. And if you're a, uh, if you you know get super uh, particular about your units, this equation would drive you crazy. Okay, this is where empirical relationships come into play. Now, you materials folks saw these types of equations last semester, and, and how do they work? Anybody remember? How, how do these equations work in terms of units? I'm going to say this real quick. You put in PSI, you get out PSI, okay? So if I give you a concrete, let's say I have concrete, and its compressive strength is 3 KSI. How do I determine Young's modulus? I take 57,000 times the square root of 3,000, okay? You put in your quantity in PSI, you will get out a quantity in PSI, okay? So just remember that. Put in PSI, get out PSI. So when you do this calculation for, you know, 3 KSI concrete, you'll take 57,000 times the square root of 3,000, you'll get a really big number. It'll be like, you know, 3 or 4 million or something like that. That will be in PSI. So just be conscious, be cognizant of your units. Okay? Yes, sir? No, no, because, because it, think about this. Like, it's not as simple to, um, you know, you're talking about it, it's a square root. You know, the square root of like 4,000 versus the square root of like 4, it, it's not one-to-one. -one. Now, now, let me also say this. In the bridge spec, they've actually reworked this equation so that you do put in KSI and get out KSI. It ends up being like 1820 times the square root. But for the building spec, we keep everything in PSI. And in all honesty, more often than not, pound, let's, let's say, let me say it like this. Using pounds versus using kips in the, uh, uh, in the building world, it's, it's pretty interchangeable. I'm a kip person, but it's pretty interchangeable because the loads can be a little less. In the bridge world, I mean, you're seeing like 100 kips, moments of 3,000 foot kips and whatnot. So kips is pretty, pretty universal in the bridge world because the loads are just so much heavier. So, good question. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> now, um, like I said, concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in compression, but in tension, uh, it, it not so much. Um, what we need is we need an estimate, and we need a way of determining how a concrete behaves when it's subjected to tension. Now, um, we have, um, for those of you who had materials last semester, we evaluated this directly through those beam tests that we did. If you remember, we did a test in, uh, in, in civil engineering materials that did something that looked something like this. We cast a beam that was comprised entirely of concrete. We loaded that beam in three-point bending, used a little bit of mechanics of deformable bodies and some structural analysis to figure out what was the stress that caused that concrete to crack, right? We called that stress a modulus of rupture. Now, if you have concrete available and you can go do the test, that's going to be a very accurate way of determining your, um, uh, your rupture strength. But in our world, you know, if I have a beam that I need to design and all I know is, okay, here's the type of concrete it's, that I'm going to use, I need a way of predicting that. Now, you, you can also, I'm, I'm going to skip over this real quick because 
you can use either a beam test or what's called a split cylinder test. You actually load a cylinder on its side and you can uh, develop a prediction uh, that way as well. We didn't do that uh, in, um, uh, in, in materials, but that's another way of doing it. But the, the point I want to make is that um, if you're in design world and you've got to design the beams for a building or a parking garage or a bridge or something, you know, you need to come up with a design. You need to come up with dimensions and something that can be built. Um, uh, you can, if you have, if you had experimental data available to you, well, well use it. But more often than not, us structural engineers, we're really not going to rely on the experimental data as more, uh, instead we're going to rely more on these empirical models. So the idea is that these empirical models will provide us a prediction of, <coughs> will provide us a prediction of Young's modulus of the rupture strength, et cetera. And then you'll be doing quality testing uh, on site to ensure that you're actually meeting uh, those limits. That, that's sort of the, the, the way it works. Um, this is a similar model that you can use to determine the rupture strength or the rupture stress, modulus of rupture, of a given batch of concrete. So the idea is that given a concrete's compressive strength, what is the modulus of rupture? In other words, how much stress causes that concrete to crack in tension? That's what the modulus of rupture is. So 7.5 times lambda times the square root of FC prime. So first off, again, square root of FC prime, anytime you see that, you put in PSI, you get out PSI, okay? That's point one. Now this term, uh, lambda, that you're seeing on the slide, lambda is, is a parameter that we throw in there to account for lightweight concrete. If you're using a concrete that has lighter aggregates or, or a lighter mix or whatnot, um, you, you will ultimately get a little bit of a reduction in your modulus of rupture. So if you've got normal weight concrete, lambda is just one. Anything times one is itself, so it's not changing anything. But if you have lightweight concrete or something like that, um, your, your, your uh, tensile strength or your modulus of rupture uh, is going to go down. And that's what uh, lambda uh, is trying to do. Sound good? Okay. Now, that's, uh, that's concrete. Let's talk a little bit about steel. Okay. So this is reinforced concrete design. So we've got to talk about not only the, proper, the properties of concrete, but we also have to talk about the properties of the steel that goes into the concrete. Now, steel uh, uh, ultimate strengths and yield strengths and whatnot are a function of the grade of steel that you're using. So for instance, if you've got grade 40 steel, it's going to have different yield strengths and tensile strengths than grade 70 or grade 80, uh, et cetera. But one fundamental property that does not change for steel is its Young's modulus. Regardless of whatever grade of structural steel that you are using, the Young's modulus remains constant. And the Young's modulus for steel is 29,000 KSI. That's, that's like, you know, what, what's the unit weight of water in U.S. units? See, it's one of those numbers that just you should remember, you know, like unit weight of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. The Young's modulus for steel, 29,000 KSI. It's one of those numbers that just want burned into the back of your head. You know, I'll, I'll be at senior design, be doing your final presentation. Any questions? What's the Young's modulus for steel? If you can't answer that, F. Because <laughs> really? I give him this really serious look like, what do you think? <laughs> No, I, I'm not going to do that, maybe. Um, but, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, that is a number that you want burned into the back of your memory, especially for structural engineers. You use it so much. So it is a number that you'll want to remember. It's either 29,000 KSI or 29 million PSI. Or for you uh, metric folks, it's about 210 gigapascals. So, uh, so what have you. I don't know. I don't believe in the metric system. I think it's all just a roundabout way of dividing by zero. No, I'm, just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not really. All right. So um, the the a <laughs> I really am kidding. All right. Um, the ASTM uh, uh, grade of steel that we use commonly for reinforcement is ASTM A615. Okay. Um, an ASTM A615 is available in different grades of steel. So you can buy ASTM grade 40, ASTM grade 50, et cetera. And the grade uh, refers to the yield stress. So everybody here remembers what yield stress means. You take an element, 
you apply load to it. If you let it go and it snaps back to its original uh, state, that is elastic behavior. Yielding is when it stops behaving elastically. It's like if you have a Coke can in your hand and you squeeze it very lightly and let it go, it'll sort of spring back. But as soon as you take that Coke can and do that, and it remains permanently crunched, that element has yielded. And yield stress is when is that, that point between elastic behavior and inelastic behavior. So the grade refers to the, the yield stress for seal. So if I had grade 60, its yield stress would be 60 KSI or 60,000 PSI. By and large, one of the most common grades of reinforcement uh, for seal, one of the com most common grades is grade 60. That's a very common value uh, that you're going to see. Now, rebar comes in various sizes, so we have, you know, and the sizes are, are represented by numbers, so uh, you might have number four rebar, number five rebar, uh, et cetera. Um, just, I, I know this is going to be a, a recollection right here. What's the diameter of a number seven rebar? 20 millimeters. The number divided by eight, seven divided by eight millimeters. Uh, um, to determine the diameter of, of some commonly available rebar, let, let, me, sort of, let me sort of define some rebar uh, uh, concepts for you. So first off, anything from a number three to a number eight, I mean rebar is circular in, in cross-section, so samurai sword or lightsaber through the rebar, I'm going to have essentially a circular cross-section. The diameter of anything from a number three to a number eight, I take that number and I divide it by eight. So the diameter of a number seven rebar is seven eighths of an inch. The diameter of a number five rebar is five over eight, so five eighths of an inch. Okay? <coughs> so that's how I determine the diameter. And if I got the diameter, then pi over four d squared, I can get the cross-sectional area. Okay? Now number nine. A number nine rebar is, is a very common bar that we tend to use in, in, in class settings and in practice. You also tend to find this bar on the FE exam kind of kind of commonly. And, and the reason why is because a number nine bar has a cross-sectional area of one square inch. So it's one of those things like if you do some math and you determine that you need five square inches of rebar, and you say, well, how many number nines? Use five number nines. You see what I mean? So it, it's easy to remember. Okay. Uh, the number 10, if you look at the number 10, it's the, the bar where the diameter and the area are kind of equal. So you can see it's a diameter of 1.27 inches and the area is 1.27 square inches. And these much larger bars are for much more uh, heavy applications. I mean, you're not going to see very many number 18 bars on a typical floor beam in a building because that is a big bar. But a number 18 is something that you might see in the column of a 40-story building or, or something like that. that that's going to see some, some serious load. So <clears throat> one of the things I gave you uh, in those design aids I gave you on day one was a spreadsheet, the beam design aid. And that spreadsheet has, if you look at, you know, if you have like number seven bars and you have four of them, what's the area? And there's all sorts of, of different multiples and, and iterations, and we will use that for design purposes uh, throughout the, the semester. So you all have a hard copy of that. It's also available uh, on Blackboard. Um, <coughs> welded wire fabric is something we really won't talk about very much in this class. For those of you that take senior design, if we do a structures project, we'll probably mention that a little more in there. Um, but welded wire fabric basically looks something uh, like this. It's primarily used for things like slab reinforcement and shear reinforcement for elements that are pretty thin. Um, the elements that we're going to be designing in this class are pretty bulky and, and, uh, and welded wire fabric probably wouldn't work very well for, for, for our purposes and for the loads that we're going to see in here. Um, but it's, it's just another means of providing uh, reinforcement. It's typically uh, delineated uh, something like this. So the, the, the first two numbers, so the 6 by 12, the, those tell your, uh, your, your bar spacing longitudinally and transversely. So if it was 6 by 12, I'd have 6 inch longitudinal spacing and 12 inch uh, transverse spacing. So if I'm talking about, let's say, a, a beam longitudinal spacing this way, transverse that way. Uh, the other two numbers, the 16 and the 8, are the areas of those, of those bar. And, and they're in hundreds of, of square inches. Uh, per foot. So that's just a little bit of food for thought. We're not really going to use it very heavily in here, but I just wanted you to be aware of it. Yes, sir? Do we use the limited uh, the polymorph that we learned from those 
uh, so the question was, are, are, are these eliminate, are these trying to eliminate tying off rebar? So you're, ta are you talking about like in a slab? It's so like if you, yeah. Um, the answer, yeah, actually, actually that, that's, that's a very common application. So just so everybody's aware, if you've ever been on a, uh, let's say a, a bridge construction project, for some of you that have had DOH work, and you see them pouring a bridge deck or, or a, a bridge deck for a, a uh, uh, you know, out of concrete, there's a, a grid of rebar that goes under that deck. You've got rebar going this way and rebar going that way. And so what will happen is once that rebar is placed, you'll have folks with these little wire ties tying the whole thing together, and they, that takes a long time. Um, the, yeah, they have, yeah, it, it takes a long time. Um, so would welded wire fabric uh, avoid that? Yes, it would. But the problem, at least in a bridge setting, the loads are so high that it really wouldn't work. It is possible for something like shrinkage reinforcement or temperature reinforcement in a, in a floor in a building because the loads are not as high. That's a very significant uh, application, but not in something like a bridge. The loads are just too heavy. But yes, so. Sound good? OK. All right. Now, let's talk about uh, beams. Okay, just so you all are aware, we are going to spend a significant majority of this class, I'm talking like the semester, on beams, okay? We're going to talk about beams of different geometry. We're going to talk about a beam's uh, resistance under moment, under shear, how do beams behave under deflection, all, all sorts of different concepts. And beams are, are really going to be the, the bread and butter of what we talk about. Before we get into some heavy, um, uh, 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 you know, particular concepts with beams, we need to take it from square one. And what I want to talk about uh, starting off is I want to talk about how beams generally behave when they're being bent, okay? So in other words, I got a beam, it's being subjected to, you know, let's say a distributed load or something like that. I think everybody in this room should be able to analyze, perform the structural analysis on a beam like this. You know the shear diagram is going to look something about like this. The moment diagram, remember, lot to a little, little to a lot. It's going to look something like that. Okay, but I want to take this to the to the next phase, to the next the, the next logical evolution of this idea. What happens if that load keeps increasing? The load gets heavier and heavier and heavier. What happens to the beam? Okay. See, here here's the idea and the fundamental concept behind structural design. The first thing when you're learning a concept of structural design, the first thing that you need to understand is how much force, how much load is required to fail a given element. In other words, if I have a beam, how much is it going to take to, to bust that beam in half or fail that beam? Okay, Because if you have a numerical understanding of that concept, you can then ask the following question. Well, how deep does that beam need to be so that that doesn't happen? How much rebar needs to go into that beam so that that doesn't happen? And if you understand that, that's design. Given a structural uh, loading scenario, size your beams and columns effectively so that the structure is safe. That is structural design in a nutshell. Okay. So the first thing we need to talk about is how a beam behaves under applications of load. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a fictitious beam sort of in our head we're going to keep increasing the load higher and higher and higher and start doing some calculations to represent uh, its behavior. So, I would, so I, I'm going to propose to you a series of stages of concrete beam behavior. The first stage is when the beam is uncracked. So you all, uh, especially for those of you that had 321 last semester, um, you, we saw this happen in the lab. We, we fabricated some concrete beams that didn't have any reinforcement in them. And we loaded them uh, until failure, okay? So we loaded them, loaded them, loaded them, and then they cracked. And when they cracked, they were done, okay? Now, what would have prevented them from just cracking in half like they did in, um, in, uh, 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 in, in civil engineering materials in the lab, would have prevented that would rebar, actually having rebar reinforcement inside the beam. We didn't have reinforcement in those beams, so they just gave up, okay? So, the first thing that I want to try and ask is I want to try and understand a concrete beam's behavior when it is uncracked, and I want to know how much load causes it to crack. Okay? Now, a couple things. Number one, 
if a reinforced concrete beam cracks, does that mean that the beam is unusable and we all need to go scream running away? The answer is no. But let me explain something to you about concrete. There are only two types of concrete. There's wet and there's cracked. The concrete cracks. It, it, it does. I'm, I'm sorry to, 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 to lay it on you like that, but concrete is a material that cracks. It just does. That's why we put reinforcement in there. What we need to understand is a concrete beam's behavior before and, and after cracking. So I propose that in or, you know, if we're talking about stage one, a, a concrete beam is, is uncracked, we're talking about relatively low loads. It does not take a lot of load to crack a beam. Okay? So under these really low loads, I'm going to assume that the concrete beam is behaving linearly. I mean, you remember that nonlinear stress strain curve. Well, I'm only talking about that small little portion right there at the beginning before it cracks. So in that small little area, we'll keep it simple and we'll go ahead and assume that concrete uh, is behaving linearly. Now, if it's behaving linearly, that means we can break out the use of uh, uh, the modulus of elasticity. But one of the things that you will find, um, and this is going to become important here in a little bit, one of the things that you're going to find is that we have a beam that is comprised of two different materials. After the beam cracks, handling a beam that is, that is made up of two different materials becomes a little tricky. And one of the things that we will have to employ is this. This is what's called a modular ratio. This is basically taking the modulus of elasticity of your stronger material and dividing it by the modulus of elasticity of your weaker material. For those of you that, I know there's a few of you in here that had me for mechanics of deformable bodies. We did this in there when we looked at composite beam assessment. Um, if you didn't do that in 216, no worries. We're going to take it one step at a time in here, and I think you'll find it's really not that difficult, but you kind of need to understand this concept because that's really what we're talking about through this entire semester. You've got a beam that's made up of two materials. You know, all that stuff that we did in structural analysis and sigma equals M MY over on all that, that all assumes that the beam is made of one material. So in order to transform that beam into a, 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 a homogeneous uh, cross-section, there's a little bit of discussion that goes into that. We'll, we'll take it one step at a time, but it's just something I, I wanted to mention. It's called the modular ratio. That's what N represents. And, and basically, it's the, um, the, the ratio of the modulus of elasticity of the stronger material and the modulus of elasticity of the weaker material. Um, I don't want to... I don't want to spoil anything or, or load too many facts on you right now, but what I will say is this. This is the simplest way of, uh, of putting it. If I have a beam that has, let's say, two square inches of steel, I could theoretically replace that with a larger amount of concrete, with like 16 square inches of concrete. So now instead of having a beam that is steel and concrete, I have a beam that's just concrete, and I've changed the shape accordingly. It's called transforming. We'll deal with that later, but that'll become more important when the beam has cracked. Before the beam is cracked, we just conservatively neglect that. It, it'll come up later. Just, just bear with me. All right. Sound good? Okay. Now, <laughs> under stage one, so remember, we, we've got this beam and we're beginning to load it. Now, under these really low load levels, I mean, we're talking about, you know, feathers on the beam. We're talking about really light loads. Well, maybe a little bit more than feathers, but we're talking about really light load levels. The beam will remain elastic until it cracks. So the first thing I want to know is what is the cracking moment? What is the moment that will cause that beam to crack? Now this equation right here, this may seem like it just sprang from nowhere, but really all this is is this, okay? Remember that? Now watch this. If I solve for the moment, I'll multiply both sides by I and divide both sides by Y. That's all this is, right? A stress times a moment of inertia divided by Y. That's, that's, that's all this is, okay? So I don't want you to think that, like, this equation is magic or it came from nowhere. It's really just taking what you learned in 216 and determining a moment. The idea is if you have a material that has a maximum stress value, what's the moment that will cause that stress value? That's what this is in a nutshell. Okay? And don't worry, if it's been a while, 
we're going to exercise this. We're going to take our time with it. Sound good? Any questions? All right. Don't worry. We'll take our time with it. Okay. So I have a beam here, and we're going to determine its cracking moment. We're going to do some calculations. So uh, we sort of, you know, dust off the old Casio FX115 ES pluses and, and whatnot and, and get into doing some, some math. It's lecture four, and other than that takedown, we really haven't done any math. It's like, come on. We're engineers. All right? So <laughs> I have a beam, and we're going to do a couple things. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a beam. I have a beam that's subjected to a, uh, a moment of 25 foot kips. All right. Hold on, hold on. All right, I got a beam. It's subjected to a moment of 25 foot kips. I want to know what the stress is on the bottom of the beam. Okay. So the first thing that we have to determine is whether or not that beam has cracked or not. Okay. So we're going to determine that first. So we're going to determine. Um, uh, it, it, it's cracking moment, and th then we'll go back to this. I, I want to I do that first to make sure everybody's aware of what's going on. Um, but don't worry, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take our time with it. Okay, so for the beam shown, here's the dimensions. Now, I want to be clear on something. Okay, if you look at this terminology, so like for instance, I have H is 18 inches. H is the height of the beam. I am not used, those dimensions are not being thrown at you flippantly, those terms. Like when I, when I use the word or the letter H, in this course, H is always going to represent from the top of the beam to the bottom of the beam, always. There is a very specific set of symbols and terminology that we are going to stick to in this class. So for instance, if I use the letter D, D is always going to go from the top of the beam to the center of where the, the, the rebar is, always. That is always going to be the case. Okay? B is always going to be the width of the beam, always. Now we're going to add some stuff to this and we're going to increase some specificity as we move forward, but these symbols, I don't throw these letters at you uh, flippantly. We will use these symbols very explicitly. So A sub S, A sub S is always the area of steel, always, okay? Sound good? That's something that, that's a little different when you get into structural design as opposed to structural analysis. You're following codes and specifications, so the symbols and the terminology tends to always be the same. You're always using the, the same terminology. So just, just be aware of that. Right, I'm actually going to copy this because I am lazy. Oh, goodness. Bless you. All right. So this is example two. Okay. So let's sort of take this one step at a time going through our, our lecture that we did, and let's see if we can, can follow through with what's going on. So let, let's go to our cracking moment expression, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to determine the cracking moment. Okay, the cracking moment is how much moment it takes to crack the bottom of this beam. Now our equation that we use for cracking moment is FR IG over YT. Oh, I want that to be a subscript, YT. So it's literally just sigma equals my over i, but sigma equals my over i, just rearranged and solving for n. Okay? So let's take these one at a time. Okay? Now, let's start off with, uh, with ig. Now, ig is what's called the gross moment of inertia. I'm going to test your memory a little bit. Anybody remember how to compute the moment of inertia of a rectangle? BH cubed over 12. There we go. See? Bringing it back. Okay, BH cubed over 12. So that is 12 inches 
times 18 inches cubed over 12. Say it again. 5832 what? Nope. Inches to the fourth. Do I have a second on that? All right. Now, let's see if you all were paying attention on this. How do we determine the modulus of rupture? 7.5 lambda square root of FC prime. There we go. Now, help me out. Lambda. What is lambda? The, the weight of the concrete. And for this problem, we are using normal weight concrete, so lambda is 1. Okay? So we'll say you know, lambda is 1 for normal weight and FC prime is 4 KSI. Now, if it's 4 KSI, remember the way this works, 7.5, 1.0 times the square root of 4,000 PSI. This is one of those empirical expressions. You put in PSI and you get out PSI. So what do we get? Yes, sir. That's a good question. So are we talking about just a little flake of crack or the whole beam cracking in half? This is how I answer that. If there was no rebar in the beam at all, the beam's cracking in half. Okay? With rebar in the beam, this is when cracking begins. Does that make sense? We, the crack begins to propagate throughout the beam. Good. These are good questions. All right. Say it again. So 474... Point three four. What is that? PSI. Okay. All right. Now, now I'm asking. Now I'm asking you two. All right. So sigma equals m y over i. What's y? Anybody remember that? No, 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 no. Oh goodness. What were you gonna say? What were you gonna say? There we go. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't remember that, so, so here, here's the deal. All right. Where is the centroid of this, this beam? It's a rectangular beam. Maybe something about like that? Okay. Now, if I'm bending a beam, right, if I'm taking this, this beam and I'm bending it in half, I'm applying a load, the top of the beam is being compressed, the bottom of the beam is being stretched, right? So how far is it? from the centroid, instead of the tippy, tippy, tippy top, instead, because of tension, we're looking at the way bottom, the very, very bottom, the extreme fiber, the lowest point on the beam. How far is it from here to here? That dimension is yt. And what is that? Nine inches. N now, let me show you something. Look at the next example. The next example is not a rectangle. It's a T-beam, right? So it's not as simple as just a rectangular cross-section where you can just look at it and say, well, it's 18 inches tall, so it's half that. We're going to have to determine that centroid on the next example. That's going to break out some stuff from statics and, and deformables you haven't seen in a while. Don't worry. Don't worry. No, 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 no post-traumatic stress conditions. We're, we're going to be all right. All right. Real quick, let, let's finish this calculation out, and then we're going to call it. Okay? So... If we've got yt and we've got fr and we've got our gross moment of inertia, I propose that the cracking moment is going to be 474.34 psi times 58.32 inches to the fourth and uh, 9 inches. Now, before we do any calculations, let me ask you a question. This is a moment. All right. What are the units of this moment going to be if I just plug and chug right now? Pound inches, like inch pounds, right? Because it's a force times a distance. Inch pounds, that's a tough moment for me to understand. I like foot kips. 
Okay? So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take this moment and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to multiply it by the following. One foot per 12 inches. And then I'm also going to multiply it by one kip per 1,000 pounds. See, each one of those fractions are one, but they will convert us into a consistent unit system. So now I will get a moment that is in foot kips. Now tell me what the answer is. 25.6. Do I have a second on that? So what that means is this. You tell me, has this been cracked or not? It has. How much moment is being applied to it? 25 foot kips. And the cracking moment is 25.6. So it hasn't cracked yet, but ooh, it's close, right? So, but up until now, we can assume linear behavior. Again, if you actually compute the maximum capacity, the nominal capacity of this beam, it's way above 25 foot kips. And we'll get to that later on. So first off, so our cracking moment is 25.6 foot kips. All right. We will continue this example and our next example on Monday. Don't forget, you all have a homework due. That's all I got. We'll see you all on Monday. You all have a wonderful weekend.